Ever notice how liberal white people who constantly whine about how racist white people are always exclude themselves? Ladies and gentlemen, behold Michael Moore. Two thirds of all white guys voted for Trump. That means anytime you see three white guys walking at you down the street toward you, two of them voted for Trump. You need to move over to the other sidewalk because these are not good people yeah. that are walking towards you. You should be afraid of them. I, we, you should be afraid of white Trump voters. Now, who does that sound like? You know, to just be grossly generalistic, you could put half of Trump supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables. <laughs> right? The racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic, you name it. Okay, let's examine who should be afraid of whom. Let's look at black, white, interracial, violent crime. Here are the facts. The Bureau of Justice Statistics released its 2018 survey of criminal victimization. According to the study, there were 593,598 interracial violent victimizations, excluding homicide between blacks and whites last year including white on black and black on white attacks. Blacks committed 537,204 of these interracial felonies, or 90%, and whites committed 56,394 of them, or less than 10%, end of quote. Now for young white men, the number one cause of preventable death is accidents, you know, like car accidents. For young black men, the number one cause of preventable death is homicide, almost always at the hands of another young black man. In 2018, here's what the CDC said. Homicide was the 16th leading cause of death overall in the United States. The third leading cause of death for children aged one to four. The fourth leading cause of death for children aged five to 14. Young, non-Hispanic black males were disproportionately affected by homicide, which was the leading cause of death among non-Hispanic black males aged 15 to 34 years, end of quote. Now, who said this? There is nothing more painful to me at this stage in my life than to walk down the street and hear footsteps and start thinking about robbery. Then I look around and see someone white and feel relieved. We've got the power right now to stop killing each other. There is a code of silence based upon fear. Our silence is a sanctuary for killers and drug dealers. There must be a market revolt. The victim has to rise up." End of quote. The author of those two statements, Jesse Jackson, you know, the one on the right. Sadly, this Jacksonville, Florida newscast all too common. The bodies of those three young men who were shot and killed last night are now here at the medical examiner's office awaiting autopsies. We looked at the statistics and we found that young African-American men have a much greater risk of being killed in homicides than men their same age from different races. The crime tape, evidence markers, and bullet-riddled cars. It is a scene that we have witnessed again and again. Liberal Fox News pundit Juan Williams. And I've been writing this and I feel this deeply in my heart. I wrote a book about this many years ago and took a lot of criticism. I understand that we are at a moment where people are very upset about the police activities. But you're right, it's on a daily basis. The carnage is black on black, typically young black male on young black male. And you don't hear the same outcry. Where is the civil rights movement on this issue? Juan Williams said the number one cause of preventable death for young black men was homicide. He got fact checked last year. PolitiFact found that 93% of murder victims were killed by someone who shares their race. Compared to other ethnicities, the numbers really stand out. 40% of African American males, 15 to 34, who died were murdered, according to the CDC, compared to just 3.8% of white males who died. Overall, 14% of all men, 15 to 34, who died in 2011 were murdered. In 2011, 
black males, 15 to 34, were 10 times more likely to die of murder than whites of the same group, end of quote. <laughs> well, PolitiFact rated Juan Williams' statement, true. Now what about all homicides? Of all the murder victims for whom race was known, 51.9% were black or African American. 43.5% were white, and 3.0% were of other races. Race was unknown for 243 victims. So, about half the nation's homicide victims were black, even though blacks comprised just 13% of the population, and whites, at 60% of the population, committed about 43% of the homicides. So blacks are overrepresented in the homicide stats, and whites are underrepresented in the homicide stats. Come again, Michael Moore? Two-thirds of all white guys voted for Trump. That means anytime you see three white guys walking at you down the street toward you, two of them voted for Trump. You need to move over to the other sidewalk because these are not good people yeah. that are walking towards you. You should be afraid of them. <laughs> well, Michael Moore tells us we should be fearful of white Trump voters because they're not good people. But Rasmussen asks blacks, whites, and Hispanics of these three groups, which one is, quote, more likely to be racist, close quote. Whites said blacks, Hispanics said blacks, blacks said blacks. Americans consider blacks more likely to be racist than whites and Hispanics in this country. 37% of American adults think most black Americans are racist, according to a new Rasmussen Report national survey. Just 15% consider most whites racist, while 18% say the same of most Hispanic Americans. Among black Americans, 31% think most blacks are racist, while 24% consider most whites racist, and 15% view most Hispanics that way. End of quote. Now what about hate crime? Let's take a look at the 2017 FBI stats. Hate crime offenders, 50.7% were white versus 60.7% of the population. 21.3% were black versus 13% of the population. Now what's going on here? It's the elephant in the room, lack of black fathers in the home. But here's the question I have. Where are the dads? When there are no fathers around to raise a young black boy to uh, develop into a healthy human being, what you end up with, when, when that father's not there to shape behavior, you end up with a young man who is unmanageable and he ends up being a misfit that the law enforcement officer has to deal with aggressively, unfortunately. So what we need to do is stop all this nonsense within the black community, take hold of our families, start having more effective parenting, stop with this charade about the police uh, use of force when in fact underclass behavior is at the forefront of a lot of what's going on in the American ghetto. Now Malcolm X says the big enemy of black people are liberals just like Michael Moore, who peddle nonsense, they talk about how they have the solution, they have the idea, they have the cure. Here's what Malcolm X said about people like Michael Moore. The worst enemy that the Negro have is this white man that runs around here drooling at the mouth, professing to love Negroes and calling himself a liberal. And it is following these white liberals that has perpetuated problems that Negroes have. If the Negro wasn't taken, tricked, or deceived by the white liberal, then Negroes would get together and solve our own problems. I only cite these things to show you that in America, the history of the white liberal has been nothing but a series of trickery designed to make Negroes think that the white liberal was going to solve our problems. Our problems will never be solved by the white man." End of quote. <laughs> Finally, one more thing about our woke friend Michael Moore. He steadfastly insists he's not in the 1%. I, I need you to admit the bleeding obvious. I need you to sit here and say, I'm in the 1%. Because it's important. Well, I can't. Because I'm not. Of your argument. You are, then. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not in the 1%? I'm, of course I'm not. How can I be in the 1%? Because you're worth millions. That's, no, that's not true. That, listen, I do really well. I do well. But, but, but what's, the, what's the point, though? Isn't I that... I because I find it more interesting 
if you're in the 1%, because I think yeah. you probably are, yeah. you qualify, right. that you are railing against a lot of capitalist ideals. Well, then, if you believe that about me, uh, then that's really something, isn't no, it? No, I'm asking if you that accept even, that. That even, though, that even though I do well, that I don't associate myself with those who do well, I am devoting my life to those who, who have less and who've been, who've been crapped upon by this system. Not part of the 1%. I mean, the man has a net worth of $50 million. Unfortunately, Michael Moore got divorced. Unfortunately, it gave us a glimpse into his opulent lifestyle. You know, the non 1% lifestyle. This $2 million home on Torch Lake is owned by filmmaker Michael Moore and his wife of 22 years, Kathleen Glenn. I am disappointed in what appears to me to be a conflict in his values and what he represents. But now the pair just settled a high-profile divorce. In court filings, Moore had blamed his wife for going overboard and expanding the 10,000-square-foot house, reportedly in the same neighborhood as Madonna and Bruce Willis. Hi, I'm Michael Moore. Ever since his 1989 documentary, Roger and Me. Do you think it's a little dangerous handing out guns in a bank? In other films like Bowling for Columbine and Fahrenheit 9-11, Moore had built a blue-collar, anti-capitalist image. I am one person. Uh, this is a, a movement of millions of voices. Slamming the 1% at this Occupy Wall Street protest. The new court documents reveal Moore and his now ex-wife shared properties in Michigan and New York. The Detroit News reports the couple owned nine total. No comment from her lawyer. And Moore's attorney would only say the couple has mutually and amicably reached a divorce settlement. Nine houses? Nine? Well, in Michael Moore's defense, if a bad guy's out to get him, the bad guy won't know which of the nine houses Michael Moore's hiding out in. An anti-capitalist capitalist can't be too safe, right? <laughs> Stay woke, my friends. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Larry Elder, and this has been the Larry Elder Show for Epic Times. I'll see you next time. Michael Moore. Nine houses. Nine! <laughs>